Right, so I'm grateful to uh, the organizers and especially to the organizers. And I'm very pleased to be here with so many distinguished scholars. The part of Buddhist ethics, as I understand it, is the aspiration to relieve the suffering and to promote the welfare of all sentient beings. And most articulations of Indian and Tibetan Buddhist philosophy have a pretty clear idea of what does and does not count as a sentient being. Now, I was pretty satisfied with that demarcation for a long time, but recent developments in um, both science and technology have putting, been putting pressure on it. And this pressure operates at two levels. So the small but growing literature on plant learning suggests that Buddhists might have to expand their conception of what counts as a sentient being, and that could have practical implications. But the developments in machine learning pose a more fundamental challenge, because depending on how you interpret them, they may put quite a bit of pressure on traditional Buddhist understandings of psychology, um, as expressed, for example, through the framework of the five aggregates. So and I'll be talking about these issues also in relation to the question of AI safety. So to start with, why might you think that if you're trying to evaluate whether a living thing has moral standing, that learning would be a key topic to look at? Okay, so. Philosophers have various different views about what we owe to non-human animals, but I think it would be pretty widely accepted that the capacity to feel pain is a threshold condition for having a moral standard intrinsically. Okay, but what do pain and pleasure do in the psychology of animals? Right? So they're fundamentally connected with learning. An animal learns not to do things that give it pain, and it learns to repeat behaviors that lead to pleasure. Okay, so other things being equal, if we don't know much about a living system, but we do know that it can learn, that's good reason to believe that it may have moral standard in its own right. Now, there have been hints and indications for a long time that plants might have the capacity to learn, but recently results have been coming out uh, that I think are much stronger in that direction. And um, Monica Gagliano and her collaborators have been producing the most important work. In view of the replication crisis, I think we need to be a little bit cautious um, before we uh, uh, draw conclusions here. But the evidence now available is enough um, to, I think, uh, really make us sit up and take notice. So, the most, single most impressive experiment uh, published in a journal affiliated with Nature um, was done by Cagliano on garden peas. Okay, so like many other plants, peas grow towards the light. If you put them in an opaque Y-shaped tube, and then when they get to the, the point in the middle, they'll grow in the direction where they've most recently felt the light coming from. Okay, 100% of them do that under most conditions. But you can intervene experimentally, and you can blow a fan that produces a current of air onto the pea plant, and then you can shine the light in the same place that the fan is coming from. You, you do that for a while. And then, you, uh, when the plant gets to the, the, bed, the, the fork in the Y, you blow the fan. And more than 60% of the pea plants they'll grow towards the fan, even if that's not where the light was coming from last. Or you can, for a long time, blow air at them and then have the light come from the opposite direction, and then more than half of the pea plants will grow away from the fan, even if that's not where the light was coming from last. So it looks as if the plant is learning to positively or negatively associate the air currents with the light. Okay, so, the most obvious place where this um, result, if it turns out to hold up and be replicable, could have applications for Buddhists is in relation to dietary restrictions, right? And so uh, let's start with the uh, very traditional framework from the Vinaya texts of pure in the three respects, right? So monastic practitioners are supposed not to eat meat that they have seen, heard, or suspected has been killed specifically for that. Now, I think there are two main ways of trying to understand the basic values behind the pure and the three respects rule. So one family of ways to understand it places a great deal of emphasis on the idea of pure, right? So the thought is that it somehow supports the um, practice of Buddhist monastics or 
contributes to the nobility of their lifestyle, if they disassociate themselves from this ugly, messy, violent business of killing animals to eat. The other basic way of understanding it connects it to the idea of living in a way that reduces the suffering we cause to sentient beings. So in a society without refrigerators, if um, leftovers of meat are not eaten quickly, they're going to spoil, right? And so that means that roughly into a first approximation, if monastic practitioners only eat leftovers of meat and they don't eat meat that's been killed specifically for them, then they're making little or no marginal contribution to the number of animals who have to be slaughtered. And now, the main point that I want to make here is that the plant learning results bear differently on these two conceptions of what dietary restrictions involving meat are about. So if you want to um, reduce the suffering that you cause or minimize the suffering that you cause while sustaining your life, that goal still makes a great deal of sense in the context of plants being sentient beings. In fact, paradoxically, you can still argue for a plant-based diet under those circumstances because a vegetarian or vegan diet is actually going to reduce the number of plants that have to be harvested. Since animal agriculture involves growing and harvesting a very large number of plants to feed them to the food animals. So um, actually on that line of reasoning, the practical difference might be small. But if you're looking for purity and plants can feel pain, you're just not going to get it. There's this passage in the training anthology of Shantideva, Shikshashim Chaya, it comes right after he endorses vegetarianism based on the old Avatar Sutra. And the passage is linguistically quite difficult. Maybe somebody would like to look at me, it with me. I'm not sure I've got all the details, but the meaning seems fairly clear. He's saying that a charnel ground practitioner is allowed to eat meat, given that the charnel ground practitioner's overall intention is to benefit sentient beings. Okay, but if plants are sentient beings, then this is the charnel ground right here, and we have never been out of it. Now let's turn to what is philosophically an even more fundamental challenge, um, and this is the development of machine learning. So machine learning has um, turned out to have a very large number of practical applications, in business and other spheres of life. But the easiest way to explain the, the um, immense power of this approach um, is with the results on combinatorial games. Uh, so take, for example, uh, the game that's called in English and Japanese Go, men uh, So for a long time, it was not possible to um, write a computer program that could beat a Go master. Right? That, that problem stood for a long time. In 2016, Google DeepMind released a program called AlphaGo, which had been trained on very large numbers of Go games played by humans. Um, and it defeated the World Go champion, Lise Ball. Uh, the program made moves that no human Go player would have made. Right? In retrospect, we can understand why they were good moves, but they were enormously surprising at the time. One year later, in 2017, the same team released a program, AlphaGo Zero, which had not received any training on Go games played by humans. It was just taught the rules of Go, and then it played Go with itself astronomically many times until it attained um, radically superhuman levels of performance in the game um, such that it could defeat the World Go champion, and it could, in fact, defeat the earlier version of uh, AlphaGo 100 games to zero. So, when we are in the field of machine learning, we're well beyond the scenario in which a programmer decides what the objective is going to be, and then the programmer has to write a program to tell the computer to go through a series of steps in order to accomplish the goal. Instead, the programmer identifies a goal, and then there's a um, series of steps, a very, very long series of steps of reinforcement learning, in which at each stage the program has to be told whether it's achieved the goal or not, and then the, the, the program becomes extraordinarily ingenious at devising various means, many of which humans might not have come up with for achieving the goal. Now that's immensely exciting, um, and it's also quite frightening. So because it suggests, we know for sure that um, an algorithm that's produced by machine learning can exceed human capacities for strategic competition in narrowly and precisely defined areas. 
right? But it suggests that there might eventually be machines produced through a similar process that could exceed human capacities for strategic competition across a wide number of domains. And then we risk a scenario like the Sorcerer's Apprentice story, in which we give the system a goal. The system interprets the goal in a way which is adverse to our interests, that we didn't expect or intend, um, uh, but it's smart enough to frustrate our attempts to turn it off. And so this kind of scenario um, was explored in, in, and, and, and put on the agenda uh, largely in this book by Nick Bostrom, Superintelligence. So I've read a lot, a lot of philosophy books. This is the only one that's bone-chillingly terrifying. Um, so um, it raises the question of existential AI risk and puts on uh, the agenda for humanity to consider AI safety, right, as, as trying to find ways to mitigate or avoid existential AI risk. So Bostrom explores a number of scenarios, but here, here's one that will give you the idea. Right, he imagines that what if the first super intelligent AI is produced by engineers working for an office supply company? And so they write a program which is capable of recursive self-improvement. It can rewrite itself to make itself smarter. Okay, and then it works much better than they expected, so they don't actually understand how smart the program is that they've now produced. And they tell it, they give it control of a paper, paper clip factory, and they tell it to maximize the production of paper clips, right? So the machine thinks, well, okay, there's a lot of buildings around here. They have a lot of metal in them. Maybe I can harvest the metal and make more paper, paper clips. Right? Now, how might that plan fail? Well, the humans who built me, right, they might not like me turning all their buildings into paper clips. They might try to stop me from doing so. Maybe I can figure out a way to turn them into paper clips. Right? And not long after that, humanity is extinct. Okay. So if you haven't thought about this deeply, right, then you might think there's an easy way to avoid the problem. Okay, so the obvious easy way to avoid the problem is what if we tell, what if we program all of our um, uh, machines to never kill a human being, right? Then we can prevent the scenario of extinction. Okay, now there are, there are, there are two, at least two problems with that suggestion. Okay, the first problem with this suggestion is we probably won't do it. And the second problem with the suggestion is, even if we tried to do it, we, we might not be able to. Okay, so the, the, the reason be, reasoning behind the first claim is that um, military organizations around the world, but especially in the United States and the People's Republic of China, have recognized that artificial intelligence might lend them very, very significant strategic and tactical advantages in future conflicts, and they are energetically pursuing research in this area, which raises the possibility that the first super intelligent AI system may have been deliberately designed to kill humans, because it may have been created by a military Okay, but let's say we can somehow turn back from that scenario. What if we can all agree um, that we want to program machines not to kill people? Now, my argument here is going to be based on the fact that philosophers have been conducting investigations into the distinction between killing and letting die for quite a long time. That's because many philosophers in the deontological tradition of ethical reflection, they think that that distinction has tremendous normative significance. And the trouble is that the distinction turns out to be extremely difficult to pin down in any simple or clear way. Uh, so one of the best ways to show that is with a pair of examples due to Shelley Kagan from his book, Limits of Morality. So in the first example, uh, there's a comatose patient being kept alive by machines in the hospital. Um, so the uh, family of the patient consult with the doctor and authorize him to turn off the machines. The doctor gets all the necessary approval from the committees involved and so on. He follows all the proper procedures. And finally, he turns off the machines and the patient dies. So um, in we speakers of contemporary um, North American English would say that the doctor let the patient die by withdrawing support. Now imagine you have a comatose patient, and his rival sneaks into the hospital in the middle of the night and secretly turns off the machines, resulting in the comatose patient's death. Right? So we English speakers would say, the rival kills the patient. But wait, they did the same thing. The doctor and the rival, they turned off the machines. According to Kagan, what that suggests is that when we decide whether to call something killing or letting die, one of the major factors we consider is whether the action was in conformity with social norms. 
But our social norms are obviously far too complex to be codified in a computer program. Certainly we don't know right now how to do that. So an AI system that's super intelligent that never kills anyone, that sounds really good, right? That, that sounds like we solved a big part of the problem. But a super intelligence that never lets anyone die is just another version of doom. Okay. Now, not everyone agrees that uh, AI safety is something that we uh, really need to be worrying about. Uh, there are a number of uh, people who have tried to push back on Bostrom's suggestion. So one of the more interesting replies that I've seen is that we're unlikely to be able to produce superintelligence because although we can produce these amazing systems, we fundamentally don't understand what a mind is yet. So we're like medieval alchemists, right? They can make fancy things happen in the lab, and it's kind of, it's kind of cool, but they don't really know what they're doing, right? Now, I think the best reason to be sympathetic to the position that we fundamentally don't know what mind is is that we're just clueless about consciousness. And now I'm using consciousness in the way that the Western philosophical tradition uses it, subjectivity. There being such a thing as how it feels to be a particular system. Right? I mean, our, so far as I know, nobody has a really plausible theory of what consciousness is. We don't know how to really ask the question. We don't really even know whether there is something out there that we don't know about. Okay. Uh, and that actually um, relates to the topic of, I believe, the next talk. Okay. So, two possibilities, right? Let's suppose philosophers such as Daniel Dennett are right. There isn't actually any consciousness out there distinct from the information processing that we're now getting so good at artificially creating, right? So we just need bigger, faster computers with more processors and, and a little bit better software, and, and pretty soon we'll, um, you'll have it. So that hypothesis suggests that we may really need to worry about AI safety sometime during this century, that existential AI risk is an urgent concern. But it also makes it seem a little less bad, because you can think of the AIs of the future as our children, right? I mean, maybe our role here on this planet is to give birth to a machine civilization that will be far more sophisticated and advanced and wise and beautiful than anything we flesh and blood humans could have come up with. I mean, now when I contemplate the possibility of my literal biological children being turned into paper clips, I mean, the, the, those considerations are that reassuring, but at least it makes it a little bit less bad. That's the one side. On the other hand, suppose that there's something fundamental about mind that um, cognitive scientists and AI researchers really just haven't discovered yet. It's out there. And suppose that it's causally efficacious, and it explains why we don't understand consciousness. Well, in that case, maybe we won't be able to build superintelligence. And so uh, we, are, we should be less afraid of this possibility. On the other hand, it also raises the possibility that there could be an, a, a, an artificial agent that was better than humans at strategic competition across a wide range of domains, but not conscious. Right? We might actually accidentally create something like that. Okay, and that's even more frightening. So this decoupling of intelligence from consciousness could mean that we accidentally bring an end to conscious life on Earth and replace it with something that has no subjectivity and therefore in which no values that we can recognize can be embodied. Okay. But that possibility, if, if that's the way it turns out, it also raises these basic philosophical questions for Buddhist psychology. So take AlphaGo Zero as it currently exists. It has created on its own these internal representations that allow it to understand different kinds of Go situations, how a Go game is likely to unfold. Okay, um, it, with most of these machine, learn, machine learning systems, even the humans who built them understand very little about how they work. Okay, so but are those internal representational structures, are they concepts? Okay, so I'm sympathetic to suggestions that maybe that's merely derivative intentionality, right? That might be right. But could you ramp up something like AlphaGo Zero to the point where it really does have concepts, but it doesn't have any subjectivity? Okay, well, so in Buddhist terms, it would have some jnana, right? Conceptions. What doesn't it have? Well, one plausible thing you could say is it doesn't have vedana, it doesn't have feeling tones, because it doesn't have any feelings. 
But really, the, the success and failure signals, the, the reinforcement signals that are used in reinforcement learning, are playing much of the functional role for this system that pleasure and pain play for an animal, right? It's just they don't feel like anything. So it's actually not easy to say whether that's vivid or not. And, and it's, it's, it's harder even to say whether it has vijnana, right, consciousness, okay? So, or chitta. So the, the categories in the five aggregates, they start to break down. You want to say, well, it has one aspect of vijnana and not another. And so these concepts become much less useful than we might hope that they would have been. Okay, so I think, we, I think that as, as um, those of us who are interested in Buddhist philosophy need to think about how this issue might be addressed. But wait, hold on. What if the super intelligent AI has already won? And this here, this is just a simulation that we're all. Well, actually, that would be so comforting, right? Because what, who cares if the imaginary simulated um, computers destroy the imaginary simulated humans? There's nothing at stake. No fear from anywhere, right? So, and there's these arguments that it's actually likely, if, if, if you assume that superintelligence is possible, that it's actually likely that this is a simulation. So one effect of the progress in AI has been to make lots and lots of techies, Buddhist or non-Buddhist, much more sympathetic to a position structurally like Buddhist idealism, in which all of this is just like a dream, in which all of this is Vijnyakti Matra, except the Vijnyakti are data structures in a super intelligent um, virtual reality uh, computer. Of all the things I thought of um, wrestling with Bostrom's book, this is the only one that, that really provides any solace um, in the face of the AI, uh, existential AI risk scenario. On the other hand, right, whether solace is something that we should want to look for in the face of what could be the most dangerous challenge that humanity has ever encountered is itself a question that I don't presently have a good answer to. Thank you. Thank you.